Coming up on today's episode, how cheap can Google TV get? HDMI, no, you usually can't capture the good stuff. Our top five HD movies set in Alaska. And of course, the Blu-ray releases for the week of October 19, 2010. This is HD Nation. Today's episode is brought to you by the United States Air Force, Squarespace, and Audible.com. Get a free audiobook at audiblepodcast.com slash HDNation. Welcome to HD Nation. I'm Robert Heron. And I'm Patrick Norton. HD Nation is your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. Blu-ray online, satellite cable, over the air. If it's in HD, we like it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, the Engadget HD crew is calling it the largest 3D television you can purchase next year, at least uh, that we know of. We're talking about the 72-inch LG 72 LEX9, the Lex9. Kind of like that. You'll have to wait until Q2 of next year. For the netcast, come a DLNA wireless AV packed monster panel to arrive. Pretty cool. And while you're dreaming, check out Samsung's new HD TV with, quote, the world's thinnest bezel. We're talking a 55 inch screen with a point three, oh, 3.8 millimeter bezel. The point eight would be pretty cool. That would be, that's what I'm really trying to get to. Just, <laughs> that's invisible. Anyway, 3.8 millimeter. What is that? Not my pretty Less than tiny. Half of a centimeter. Pretty darn tiny. Less than a quarter of an inch. Okay, that's just the uh, the top and the top and the left edges. No, it makes sense. Top and the left edges are three point eight. Yeah. The bottom and the right edges are one point nine millimeters. So huh. the gadget HD, they a lot of good stuff for this week, by the way. They call it five point seven millimeters between displays as you stack them into a giant video wall of goodness. It all kind of makes sense now. These sound like business displays if you're stacking that many big 55 inch panels for a video wall. Uh, of course, no information on when these will ship or how much they're going to cost. So, In either uh, case, yeah. Uh, well, Q2 for the 72 inch 3D flat panel, which of course will require bezels. goggles. I like thin bezels. I've been waiting way too long for thin bezel TVs. And this one for your house. They're finally starting to trickle out there. Yeah, giant bezels suck. <laughs> you heard it here first. Oh man, if you haven't seen the pics yet, the the pictures are ridiculous. The remote control for Sony's internet TV, it, it, it's ridiculous. Though, quote, it feels nice in the hand, according to the Engadget folks. Sony's Google TV offerings are going to include 24, 32, 40, and 46 inch televisions priced from $599 to $1399 plus a Blu-ray player slash set-top box that'll bring the features to non-Google TV HDTVs for $399. So it's a Blu-ray player and it's a Google TV box, which is quite a bit more expensive than Logitech's review, which packs Google TV into a little black set-side kind of a box. No Blu-ray, of course. Uh, it includes a wireless keyboard with a built-in touchpad and an optional Logitech TV cam for video calling and ports for up to two IR blasters so you can get your remote on. And also they've got the new Harmony apps for the iPhone, iPad, and Android, which sadly require the review to work. So they're not just bringing the Harmony functionality to your cell phone. Major bummer. Of course, though, your current Harmony remote is compatible with uh, Logitech's review. If you're bored, by the way, check out review.logitech.com support and you can eyeball the setup guide and checklist. Do you see Google TV just becoming a, a, an application that you can install on just about any device? You know, a bunch of people email they want to see it as like a plug-in for Windows Media Center. Yeah. I just don't see it being that easy. Um, I, you know, it would be nice. Well, they can cram it into things like a Blu-ray player and Sony's new television. So right. I'm thinking, you know, how much harder would it be to that, that means it's just software at that point. Well, if they could do like a pass, because they basically they want to write, they want to do a pass through HDMI overlay onto whatever HDMI output's coming mm -hmm. from your okay. device. That's fancy. Right. Okay. That that's that's where it gets fancy. That's, okay. that's kind of where the hardware's coming from. And while we're talking about products they're about to ship, we should mention the V-Beam. V-Beam. V-Beam, a $99 <laughs> wireless gadget for streaming 1080p up to your, uh, to your HDTV from... USB antennas on your computer, huh? V-Beam says you'll be able to display your entire desktop or go into a play-to mode for downloaded video files. It's using wireless USB, so unless V-Beam has done something super spiffy with it, we're not betting the farm on spectacular 1080p streaming. Yeah, there's gonna be a little compression going on there or limited frame rate, to say the least. And V-Beam isn't HDCP, uh, HDCP compliant, which means it won't work with Blu-ray movies or the video from your PS3, unfortunately. Right. Well, I guess so. it wouldn't work with your PS3 anyway because it requires as a USB antenna, but yeah, no, no HDCP means no, no lockdown. Content. It just sounds like an easy way if you need to present something that's on your no 
notebook right. or computer on your big screen TV. I, I don't picture this as a video streaming technology per se. Well, it should do pretty good at 720p. Okay. Hell, that brings us, by the way, to a tweet from Oozing Machismo. <laughs> It's quite a tweet, 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 tweeter name, Twitter name. <laughs> he says he's got a big problem with the system. You guys should do a roundup of TV tuners that allow HDMI capture. We need it. No H such beast. I think we all want that HDMI capture. Yeah, what, they're, what they're, planet are you from? <laughs> there are HDMI capture cards, True. but they will not work with any HDMI channel that has HDCP tuned on, which would be oh, Blu-ray players. PS3s, um, cable satellite set-top boxes, cable satellite set-top boxes, anything that you locks down the the HDMI stream, which is probably anything you would want to record, is not going to be recordable from any commonly available HDMI capture device. I think Blackmagic Intensity is, is their HDMI capture card will not work with any HDMI output secured with HTTP. So yeah, I'm thinking component video. If you, know. if you gotta absolutely do it, sorry or. Uh, <laughs> Look around on the internet. <laughs> you can always find a file, can't you? No. I'm not touching that one. <laughs> hey, let's take a moment to hear from one of our sponsors, the United States Air Force. Today, which celebrates the former handover of the territory of Alaska from the Russian Empire in 1867, we present to you the top five movies in HD this week, well, from Alaska. While a few of our favorite Alaskan titled movies are still DVD only, we were able to come up with a pretty good list. First up, Insomnia. This remake of a Norwegian crime thriller of the same name stars Al Pacino as Nelly Coffey grapples with his sanity and sleep deprivation in the sun-drenched nights of Alaska's summer while helping a local police investigate a murder. Great role for Hilary Swank in that one, too. Next, The Edge. Sir Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin star in this 1997 survival flick where an emergency landing in the Alaskan bush pits them against the rugged wilderness and each other. A little campy, that one. Number three, 30 Days of Night. Steve Niles' horror comic miniseries is brought to life in this 2007 flick where vampires ascend on Barrow, Alaska to revel in six months of winter darkness and feast upon the local inhabitants. Next up, Into the Wild, based on a true story, adapted from a book by John Krakauer, directed by Sean Penn, starring Emile Hirsch as Christopher McCandless, who gave all his savings to charity, hitchhiked to Alaska, and, well, not hilarity ensues. Great movie, by the way. Amazing score by Eddie Vedder. Not something to watch if you're feeling a little sad about life. Number five, The Simpsons movie, when Lake Springfield turns into a toxic disaster due to Homer's negligence and a lot of pig guano. <laughs> the Simpsons escape off to Alaska to avoid angry town folk and the EPA's plan to seal off the city under a huge dome. This one's not a movie, but it's worth a mention at number six, Deadliest Catch, a personal favorite of HD Nation editor Graham Hancock and my wife. Deadliest Catch takes reality TV to the tumultuous Bering Sea off Alaska's coast as the show follows five or more crabbing boats and their crew as they face off against long hours, hostile weather, cranky attitudes, and the oh-so-fickle crab of the Northern Seas. Now, movies we want to see in HD to take place in Alaska, Mystery Alaska, uh, Mystery Alaska's local amateur hockey team invited to a one-on-one -on -one match against the New York Rangers. Fun stuff and a lot of good eye candy on that one. Check it out. I can't believe there were that many movies related to Alaska. It's amazing. I am shocked. It's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of October 19th, 2010. First up this week, Apocalypse Now. Yes, that 1979 war classic is finally out on Blu-ray. Set during the Vietnam War, this film revolves around two U.S. Army Special Ops officers, played by Martin Sheen and Marlon Brando, one of whom is sent to assassinate the other. Directed by Francis Ford Coppola, this film won the Palme d'Or at Cannes and was nominated for Best Picture for both the Academy Award and the Golden Globe, among others. Blu-ray.com gives this release a near-perfect score, saying this is about as perfect an image as one could hope for. Coppola himself personally supervised this transfer, and Blu-ray.com notes the, quote, artifact-free presentation, saying the, quote, contrast and black levels are nothing short of exceptional. This film was a key pioneer in developing 5.1 audio, and the DTS-HD Master Audio on this release shows it. 
You'll get both the theatrical release and the Redux, which adds 49 minutes to the cut, both in the original theatrical aspect ratios. Francis Ford Coppola offers a commentary on both. If you're looking forward to the extras, you will not be disappointed, unless five hours of bonus features isn't enough for you. You'll get an hour-long interview of Martin Sheen by Coppola, 26 minutes of additional scenes, a 40-minute interview of Coppola by Roger Ebert from the 2001 Cannes Film Festival, where Redux played, and a ton more. Still want more? Pick up the, quote, full disclosure edition, which includes all that, plus a feature-length documentary called Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, which gives you a peek behind the scenes at filming the epic. And it includes some home movies made by Coppola's wife and an optional commentary by the Coppolas. Next up, another classic, Criterion release of Seven Samurai. Shot in 1954 by Akira Kurosawa, this film has gone on to be widely considered one of the greatest and most influential films of all time. Clocking in at three and a half hours, this film tells the story of seven samurai, of course, who protect farmers from bandits who come to steal their crops. While the original negative wasn't available for transfer, a booklet included with this release tells us that a duplicate negative was created from the original fine grain master positive using wet gate processing. Blu-ray.com has reviewed this disc and notes that it is, quote, an exceptionally strong high definition transfer with remarkable clarity and contrast. The audio track is equally impressive with a Japanese LPCM mono track as well as a Japanese LPCM two channel track. English subtitles are available, of course. Extras include a two hour interview with Kurosawa from 1993, an hour long documentary recorded exclusively for Criterion revolving around the samurai origins and influences and a 50 minute documentary on the making of Seven Samurai featuring interviews with various Kurosawa collaborators. Also included a 60 page illustrated booklet with essays from film critics and directors. Also, 1960s Psycho. Watched this one last night. I could imagine people were more than a bit freaked out when this movie first debuted. It's the story of a beautiful blonde, ill-gotten gains, and a charismatic psychopath. Hitchcock's pacing in this film is comfortable on the eyes. The edits are sublime, interesting camera angles, and captured facial expressions. This black and white classic is presented in its original 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio, and the transfer maintained a hint of the film grain and good picture detail. This 50th anniversary release includes a new 5.1 mix that adds subtle ambient environmental and musical surround effects, but it never detracted or distracted from the action on the screen. Extras on the Blu-ray disc include full-length commentary, making of documentary, interviews, newsreel footage from the release of the film, behind-the-scenes photographs, and more. At nearly two hours, this movie is perhaps a touch too long, and the ending seemed unnecessarily detailed, but it is adult entertainment from the early 60s. And also, if you haven't seen it already, make sure your friends don't give away the secret. Other releases this week include Assault Girls, Crimson Wing, The Mystery of the Flamingo from Disney, The Howling Trilogy, Mirrors 2, 2001's Moulin Rouge, 2009's Night of the Demons, Oceans from Disney, Please Give, 2010's Predators, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, 1996's Romeo and Juliet, The Six Wives of Henry Le Fay, Vampire Girl vs. Frankenstein Girl, uh -huh. Video Games Live, Level 2, and BBC's Wallander. It's time to thank one of the sponsors of today's show, Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of downloadable digital audiobooks and spoken word entertainment. Audible has over 75,000 titles to choose from to be downloaded to your iPod MP3 player and played back anywhere, anytime. Choose from books in every genre, science fiction, thrillers, drama, comedy, business, history, and more. Want an audiobook for free? Go to audiblepodcast.com slash hdnation to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, go to audiblepodcast.com slash hdnation for your free audiobook. Jose writes in, Patrick and Robert, Sony is releasing a soundbar for the PS3 next week and I wanted to see your thoughts on it. It's retailing for $199 since I live in a condo. I don't want to buy an awesome home theater system if I can't use it to its full potential without disturbing my neighbors. So I thought this would be a viable option. Thanks, Jose in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh yeah. Soundbars are really cool, right? Because it's basically this this box that sits below your HDTV, and it's going to give you all your surround sound without having to use rear channels. They're usually pretty cheap. Um, Sony, Vizio, lots and lots of others. Toshiba, I think, was kind of the uh, what do you think? Yamaha. I think it was Yamaha. That's what I'm trying to remember. They Yamaha had one of the more interesting ones I've seen with about 
multiple drivers. Yeah. Like, literally like dozens. Dozens of drivers. To drive the sound around the room. They all should sound better than the speakers that are built in your HDTV. Do not expect, especially from the less expensive ones, don't expect the rear channels to sound like they're behind you. They won't. There may be an expanded sound stage. There may be something that sounds certainly wider and bigger than your, than your TV speakers, but it's not going to sound like real surround sound with, with you know, remote channels behind you. Um, disturbing your neighbors depends a lot on how your condo is built and how sensitive the neighbors are. I'm pretty sure in, in the, where I live, I can piss off my neighbor by snoring too loudly. Uh, using the washing machine, using the dishwasher. Uh, I find if I just close my sliding glass door that goes out to where most of my neighbors are the closest to me, I guess right. that would be, then it, the audio is not nearly as disturbing. In fact, I have a pretty well sealed room for audio, mm -hmm. so I can crank it up if I want. But the subwoofer, though, I have, if, if it's touching the wall, if it ends up moving itself a little bit, and it, right. if it's actually touching the wall, then I run into problems with it sending those vibrations through the material itself. And right. if I, as long as I keep it away from it actually touching anything, Everyone's a lot happier, it seems. So, but yeah, basically, you might want to find out. You know, ask your neighbors or tell your neighbors you're going to play a movie. Do you mind? You know, if you don't turn on like the ride of the Valkyrie scene from Apocalypse <laughs> Now at yeah. four in the morning, oh, you're wow. probably not going to be in trouble. But before ten in most towns, you can usually crank things totally. up. Totally. And you don't have to run your surround sound system at eleven all the time. It sounds better though. It no really comments. does. <laughs> Janet writes in. <laughs> Please tell us you've received your Seaton Cable TV tuner card, Robert. I recently checked their website and they're still listed as pre-order. I heard you mention in the past episode that you had received an email that they were starting to ship. It seems like I've been waiting for this card for years. If you haven't gotten yours, do you know anyone that <laughs> has? Please give me hope, Janet. Janet, funny you should mention this. Uh, two days ago, I received an email saying mine has shipped. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have a tracking number, but they claim it is in the mail. Come on, UPS. The Seton is in the mail. It is. And now, now i got to figure out if it's actually going to fit in my current case that I have my home theater PC in, or if I'm going to have to scrap that case and upgrade anyway. I think I'm going to be doing some upgrading here in the near future. You might, might want to wait until the card actually shows up before you buy that new case. Oh, no. no. <laughs> uh, most definitely. I'm going to see if I can cram it into my current case using a, a low-profile uh, bracket for it. But mm -hmm. just in case, I'll ha I might just have to scatter that on the table just to get it set up for now until I get that new case set up. So, so either you, way. You think it's really going to show up this time? I they said, they gave me the warning like last week. It's like, oh, uh, we've got some in, your name has moved up. And then two days ago, literally, I just got the email that says, we have shipped it. We have billed you. You have been charged. That, that I'm assuming, means it's on the way. So that's a good it, thing. I think the first initial few batches are finally getting out to the people. HC Nation bringing hope to yeah. would be Seton my, consumers my everywhere. My DIY quad tuning cable <laughs> DVR is about to happen. I hope. <laughs> Four channels, all recording, all the time. Going Brad to buy yet? I got to buy another cable card. So, <laughs> oh, I got a, a lease one. You can't actually own any of this crap. So, How, just one or two? Or I only need one. I only need one. So this will be the third one I own now, or lease. <laughs> I don't know. Your house is scaring me. Oh. Brad writes in, "Hi guys, love watching the show. Lots of good info. I'm trying to decide if I should bother getting a Blu-ray player or keep my Oppo Progressive Scan 1080i DVD player." I've got a 55-inch Mitsubishi rear projection TV that I will not be able to replace for several more years. It can only do 480p and 1080i using DVI or component input. Since my TV can only do 1080i, would I notice a big difference going from the unconverted DVDs to Blu-ray? Thanks for your advice, Brad. This one's a tricky one. I, right. Personally, I would skip the Blu-ray player until you get around to replacing that rear projection TV with something newer. Uh, a new Blu-ray player would enable you to feed 1080i video to your TV with that component connection, but only Blu-ray content. DVD content, if you can't really up-convert it over component. You're going to be limited to 480p with at least protected titles. If it's your own DVD that you've made yourself, you can do whatever you want with it, and the, the hardware doesn't care. My experience, and I even ran into this last week with a new TV set up at a, at a client's house, was that a new TV will make a current DVD player look a lot better than the other way around, namely upgrading your current DVD player to a, to a set that you already have. And I find that especially is the case with rear projection TVs because, one, you're dealing with an overscan issue where you're not getting full pixel resolution anyway, so I'd be less inclined to add a Blu-ray player to that. Also, it, it, it's just that, that sense of loss of detail alone is enough to make me yeah. kind of wait a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. I would just say hold off and save your money up until you're ready just to get that new set down the road. And don't, don't be too hell-bent on getting Blu-ray. But if you did, I, I'd kind of like to see if you actually did notice a difference. But I, I personally don't believe you really would get as much bang out of the buck than, say, getting that new TV set and keeping your current DVD player. 
I just, there's something about getting a new TV, especially the new widescreen flat panels, mm -hmm. and then hooking up your old, watching a DVD movie on that, because you probably have never seen the full resolution of the DVD, let alone <laughs> the upgrade to, say, a Blu-ray player with that new set, so ah, I think Are I'll just Are the resolutions leave that peculiar of rear projection TVs? It's just, you can't really get around that overscan issue, mm -hmm. so you've just lost 5% of the picture, and depending on how old it is, and his doesn't really have, except for that DVI connection, right. You know, how out of focus might it be? How, how's the convergence on the set? Does it have errors around the edge in terms of it compared to the middle? There's just so much going on that I don't think you get the most, ba and unless you're seated just perfectly in front of that set, right. I think you'd just be better off saving your money for a little bit longer. We're saving money today. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. You know, or borrow a Blu-ray player. Somebody you know must have one, and just hook it up and see what you think. That's the other quick test, if you can't wait. And, yeah. Uh, just anyway, make sure you use a really well-encoded Blu-ray to, to check it out. Yeah. Uh, another email coming in here. It says, hi, guys. I have a ton of video files, AVI, XVID, et cetera, and I would love to be able to store and play them all on my HD set. I'm not really looking to stream, but rather have one box next to my TV to store all the files. I know what you're thinking. Hmm, H home theater PC. The thing <laughs> is, though HTPC would be nice, all I really want to do, or all I really want is one go-to box for my media files and an HTCP seems a bit like overkill. Keep up the good work, guys. Signed, Corey in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Well, there actually are a lot of boxes out there that'll feed your PC, several hundred from brands' names you've never heard of. Um, you definitely want to keep an eye out to make sure it supports the video codecs you use the most. If most of your video files are XVIDs, make sure it plays XVIDs, right? It sounds silly until you get it into your house and can't use it, because uh, otherwise you'll be transcoding from your current format to something it can play, and that just takes far too long to deal with. The WD TV HD supports a ridiculous number of codecs like AVI XVIDs, AVCs, MPEG 1, 2, 4, uh, MPEGs, VOBs, MKV, H.264s. Uh, <laughs> ABC, M yeah, it's just like VC1, yeah, it, you know, move files. They should just have a list of what it won't WMB play. WMB9 files, it probably would be shorter. Uh, FLAC, MBE, WAVE, PCM, WMA, AF, AUG, uh, JPEG, GIF, TIFF, BMP, PNGs. So that would like pretty much cover any likely audio or picture or video file you would ever run into. Man, it's that's, cheap. It's covering it pretty good. And it's got a really nice interface. Um, also, uh, any of the popcorn hour boxes, which will uh, also work as a Blu-ray player if you add the Blu-ray drive via USB, or I think, no, you do have to use, do it externally on their yeah. boxes too. Uh, plus, they offer local storage, or they can stream over the internet as well. So it's kind of a good all-in-one box as well if, you, if you're just hell-bent on not building your own box. I'm always trying to keep an eye out for things I might already have, too. So, like, if, <laughs> I find a lot of people, if you have a game console of some kind, there are media streaming applications you can run on a personal computer, say, if you don't mind having a second computer running or a, a computer running period, that can handle all the transcoding of pretty much every file type out there. Right. I know there's open source uh, apps for the PS3 and I believe for Xbox as well that literally anything you put in your media folder on your computer will be able to stream and play on your console doesn't matter what file type it is the computer basically is taking care of all that legwork hmm. so there's an option too of one and way it transcodes to it on the fly or? yeah doesn't doesn't actually change anything on the computer it just says oh that's that format okay i'll twist it into something that's usually like mpeg2 or mpeg4 or windows media that the the console can support interesting yeah all sorts of good free stuff out there. <laughs> I like that thought. It's time now for a message from one of our sponsors, Squarespace. This is an amazing site, well, for hosting your website. It's flexible. It makes it easy to create a blog, a portfolio, a store, any kind of website you want, no matter what level of coding experience you have. Seriously, Squarespace has tools. If you can drag and drop, you can create a high-end, complex website that is uniquely your own without dropping a lot of cash. And don't worry if you come across any questions or issues, Squarespace offers every user 24-7 support, so if it's 4 a.m., somebody's gonna answer the phone. Now, if you haven't seen it, Squarespace's iPhone app is pretty slick. They added in some new features, including full HTML blog editing on the go and comment moderation, and they'll let you get push notifications to approve new comments, mark existing comments as spam, reply to your comments, and more, all from inside your iPhone. Many of the internet's most highly trafficked web pages are powered by Squarespace, not to mention many of the personal pages of Revision 3's hosts and personalities. Do yourself a favor, go to squarespace.com to learn more, and if you decide to purchase Squarespace, they give you a two-week free trial, then if you decide to buy in, do yourself a favor and enter in the code HDNATION, you'll score 10% off for the lifetime of your order. Pro550 sent an email titled, Some Important Info on Roku, and says, 
They do, in fact, offer some solutions for iTunes via a sharing channel and the MP3 Tunes channel. They also have a few private and public channels that enable streaming from a server, and DLNA support is coming soon. The channel listing on Roku.com does not list all of the current channels. It needs to be updated. There is a number of private channels on the box, too. One site that lists most of them is Roku-Channels.com. A good place to keep an eye on what's going down on the Roku DVP is the forums. That's forums.roku.com. Keep up the good root work. Signed, Crow550. It's awesome info, Crow, but personally, I think a lot of the private channels uh, require more hoops than most people are willing to go through to enable streaming your personal video collection to the Roku, if they can even find them. I, I, it makes me want to work up sort of a basic how-to on, on how to get, you know, serve media from your server on your Roku box. Um, but yeah, they, it's, I want to see I want to see Roku shipping with an easy way to stream media from your server. Something to be aware of, by the way, for owners of older Roku boxes, there's a cap on the number of channels you can be subscribed to at once. Newer models have like four times as much memory, so it's not really an issue. But if you find yourself not being able to add additional channels to the Roku, you might have to delete some of your older channels. Seriously though, when DLNA is active on Roku, i.e. I'll just plug it in, it'll detect media servers in my home network, I will be stupid stoked. I dealt with a TV this weekend, a new TV. Right. It actually saw my notebook over the wireless connection and I was working on it. It was just like, huh, I like this. The future's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Kate Barso wrote in, TiVo Series 3, TiVo HD, and TiVo Premiere all support USB keyboards now. The update came in July. It works great. The only drawback is you need to be right in front of your TV to use it unless you have a very long USB extension cable. TiVo is great for watching Revision 3 shows on my TV. Kate Barso. Oh, absolutely correct. And thank you for e sending that email to me. I, I just tried it out. I actually had a, uh, a wireless USB keyboard over the standard, I think it's an HI HID dongle, so it's a right. stand, no dr driverless dongle. And it worked just fine with the TiVo. I did have to use the remote to get to the field I wanted to type in, and then the typing was kind of clunky compared to the Bluetooth gear. But you can use a USB keyboard with your TiVo, if it, with your HD TiVo, if it's been updated with the latest software, which if you're still using it, it likely has. So nice. I also did try some different combinations of Bluetooth gear with TiVo slide remote. I was seeing if other Bluetooth adapters would work. No. If other keyboards would work somehow. No. So I think <laughs> TiVo has that pretty well locked down with their controller or that Bluetooth link in their remote. So uh, still, it, it, at least at least if you absolutely want to throw a keyboard on your TiVo, you think no, you I would have two options. You think I would have tried that, but no. no I'm <laughs> glad I'm, <laughs> we have the beautiful audience to remind us. So. Thank you, KBar. So yeah. Hey, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode of HD Nation. As always, we want to know what you think. So send your comments, questions, or suggestions to hdnation at revision3.com. If you haven't seen us there, check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash tech, T-E-K-H-D, tech HD. And you can find links regarding pretty much everything we talked about in today's show on the show, the, basically the show page in the show notes at hdnation.tv. Yeah. Plus, you'll find all the links to subscribe to the show. So subscribe and watch. And until next time. Thanks for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.